Hey guys, welcome to this Code On The Go vlog. Today we're gonna to talk about how Netflix uses Python. Reading this article from techrepublic.com, I will link to it below. Let me just give you the Reader's Digest. Let me give you the summary of what this article is talking about. Netflix uses Python in the classic way in which Python is used. It's used, A, Python is, to uh, glue their systems together. So Netflix, as you might imagine, being a pretty big company with 140 million users, they have all kinds of systems running. And so what they do is they use Python to reinforce the security of the systems. They use Python to analyze alerts and data and reports coming off of the systems, like activity reports and so forth. They use they leverage Python's AI capability and machine learning capability to do things like analyze movies and to optimize the streaming and to pull out images, as an example, to display thumbnails to people, etc., etc., etc. So Python is used all over the place. So, for example, in this article, they cite the different areas, operations, etc., and where Netflix uses Python's. So in the operations, they use these Python libraries, NumPy and SciPy to perform numerical analysis, Bolto3 to make changes to their AWS infrastructure. AWS is Amazon Web Services. Netflix runs off of Amazon's backbone. That's a big part of Amazon's business. They provide these huge server, uh, this huge server facilities and all kinds of super powerful servers. Anyhow, they run RQ to run asynchronous workloads. They use Flask. APIs are used as a wrapper around the orchestration tools above. They use Jupyter Notebooks and in Interact are used to analyze operational data and prototype visualization tools. So let me translate all this. So basically, Python has a huge set of libraries that do all kinds of stuff. That's one of its values. That's one of the big values it has. If you want to do something, there's probably a library for you to do it with in Python. So Netflix uses Python because it has a huge amount of libraries that are vetted and perform very, very well. And they use all this Python to basically keep the system going nicely. So that's a classic use of Python. They also use Python for machine learning to help automate certain processes. So that's another classic use of Python. So uh, for monitoring, for security. So Python, for instance, they're talking about security. Netflix information security team uses Python for a wide variety of tasks, including security automation, risk classification, auto remediation, and vulnerability identification. So. What do they use? They use Security Monkey, an open source Netflix library for monitoring AWS, Google Cloud Platform, OpenStack, and GitHub for changes to assets. They use BLESS SSH Certificate Authority to protect against SSH resources. They use RepoKid, allows Python to be used to help with identity and access management. They use Lemire, is used to help generate TLS certificates. And Netflix also uses the Diffie Forensic Triage triage tool, which is built entirely using Python, blah, blah, blah. Then they make extensive use of machine learning. Anyway, you get the idea. Remember, Python's a general purpose language. It's easy to learn. That's why people use it. But a major reason people use it is because the ecosystem around Python, it's massive. It's huge. There's all kinds of different libraries to do all kinds of different things. So when you're evaluating a language, you can't just look at the core language. You have to look at the market around it. You have to look at the ecosystem around it. Then you make your decisions. There's a reason why I teach JavaScript, I teach Python, I teach PHP, and I teach SQL. Because in my estimation, in terms of covering the different types of programming that you can do out there, web, back-end, server-side programming, front-end programming, uh, mobile, these languages basically cover everything, not only in terms of capability, but also in terms of um, concepts. These languages cover a huge array of programmatic concepts that translate across the board. All the modern programming languages share all these concepts. So, for example, in these, all these JavaScript, Python, PHP, they all, those three all have inheritance. 
I wouldn't use it too much, but they do have it. So now you understand inheritance. So whether you do inheritances with JavaScript or you jump into Python, you do inheritance there, or you go over to Java, you understand what inheritance is. There's little differences between the languages in terms of how they implement it, much like, you know, you learn to drive an Audi. I'm sitting in my Audi. If I move over to a Porsche or I move over to a BMW, the car is, you know, high-performance sports car is a high-performance sports car. You're going to, you know, there's going to be nuances and differences, but once you've driven one 350-horsepower machine to drive another 350-horsepower, you're going to be comfortable with that type of power. So... It's not the best analogy, but I think you get the point. That's why I teach these these three languages, Python, PHP, and uh, JavaScript, because they expose you to a whole range of uh, topics that are useful. So what to take away from this, how Netflix uses Python article, it shows you how Python is generally used. Uh, one last point. One thing I point out to be a major principle I have like one of my principles need to nerd learn stuff on a need to nerd basis so you got so many python libraries that you shouldn't be too concerned about trying to learn all these libraries because you may you won't use in your entire career you may you're, you're, you may use two percent of the libraries that are out there so you learn your basics and then you learn wh whatever libraries you need all you need to know with regards to python is generally where it's strong where it's weak what options you have, to have a general idea of what the libraries are like out there, and that's it. That's all you need to know as a professional coder besides the basics. And then when you run across a project or a job, you learn whatever libraries, whatever frameworks that you need to learn for that particular job. That's the way the game works, right? It's kind of like a professional fighter. A professional fighter doesn't study every single fighter on the world. No, they, they study f boxing. Uh, or MMA, they study the basics and they, they learn the, the skills. And then what they do is they learn about different types of fighters, categories of fighters. Like I'll, I'll stick to boxing, so because it's simpler. So you learn about the the inside fighter, the pressure fighter, the counter striker, and you learn a left handed fighter versus right handed fighter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you learn how these categories of fighters, how they fight in general. And then when you're faced with a particular opponent, you're going to go fight a particular opponent, then you study that particular opponent for that particular match, that particular fight. You don't study every fighter uh, every day. No, you study what you need to study for at that particular moment in time. That's the key. Same thing with software development. You learn the library that you need to learn for the job at hand. So, yeah. Final comment, uh, though Python is slow to run at runtime, I've said this many times by other principles. So the first principle is need to nerd. The second principle is the speed of runtime is much less important than the speed of write time. What do I mean by that? That you see the market over and over again will favor the language that's easier and quicker to develop an application with in terms of how much time it takes you to write the code it will favor that language over a language that's slower to build the code. So, for example, I'll go back to when I cut my teeth in this game in the 1990s. In the 1990s, Java was the new hot language, nimble language. And all the C++ people were saying, well, Java runs really slow, Pi is not as flexible as uh, C++, blah, blah, blah. And it was true. C++ is much faster at runtime, meaning when you write a C++ app, it runs this. It's a super fast. It's super fast. But when you run a Java uh, app, super slow, comparatively speaking. But Java became the dominant language because though it was slower at runtime, it was much faster to develop an application in Java than it was in C++. Same thing with Python. Though Python is slow, as you wouldn't believe, hog, hog, resource-wise at runtime, though it is slow at runtime, it is very quick and easy to develop something in Python relative to other languages like uh, C++ or C. And I cited one example in the AI world. Uh, the AI programmers, the lead people, they say, well, they used to do everything in C++, but it took just too long. So what they do is they write the core engine that needs that speed in C++ and everything else is Python. Everything else is Python. Again, because speed of write time 
W-R-I-T-E, is much more important than speed of runtime in most situations. And this is becoming more and more the case because computers, software, chips, memory, etc., is just getting faster every single year. So, for example, in another video, I talked about mobile development using the web stack versus native code. And uh, even though native code is faster than the mobile, like a mobile, mobile, mobile hybrid application, that speed every year is becoming less and less uh, important and perceptible, in fact, because uh, smartphones like this are so powerful. The, the processor in this is so powerful that people won't see the speed difference, right? Okay, so now, you know, maybe when the user interface, uh, a native, natively written user interface on a, a Pixel or an iPhone or something, maybe it takes three tenths of a second for something to load up natively. But if you wrote it in hybrid web, it, it takes an extra two tenths of a second. People don't care. It's like, you know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's not perceptible. So it doesn't matter. But in, me, but in the meantime, if you write something in a, a hybrid app using a web tech to build, your, uh, to build your mobile app, if you're able to write it in one-fifth the time or half the time and half the cost, it's worth it, right? It depends. Everything depends. So that's why I've said in previous videos where I think that native mobile development will slowly fade over time. Won't disappear, but slowly fade because of things I just talked about. So anyway, so Python is a classic example of that. Even though Python is dog slow, it is easier to write. It has a huge array of libraries to choose from. It's well vetted. It's the glue language of the world, I think. It glues systems together. It supports systems. Uh, yeah, you can't go wrong learning Python, that's for sure. All right, bye-bye.